I'd like to welcome you um, all, friends and distinguished guests, to this International Social Forum. And I'd like to welcome you to SOAS, first of all. Allow me to say a couple of words about SOAS, the host and co-organizing institution, uh, which is the right institution for this, because SOAS is unique among British universities for its focus on development, political economy, and local knowledge, all things that we will be discussing and needing these uh, two days when we go through the thematic uh, discussions. SOAS is also unique for critical and bold thinking. And no part of it is more so than the Department of Economics, which has played a role in this. So this is the right place for the Social Forum, for um, a venue to um, discuss all these burning issues that you see in the program in front of you. So allow me now to say, um, to make four points about the, uh, the substance of what we've got, got in front of us. This is a social forum that deals with the global economy, key issues of, of the global economy, and I think four issues of, are of paramount importance, all of which I hope will be discussed. The first is the shift in the balance of the world economy that we've witnessed the last three to four decades. Globalization, everybody knows about that, doesn't do any harm for me to repeat it. The shift in the center of gravity of industrial capitalism towards China and the Far East. This is where uh, it now has moved away from um, the West. Um, and that's the venue, the main site of sustained productivity growth. I say this because people often don't realize much of what's happening in our own countries here is characterized by very weak productivity growth, whereas over there, productivity growth is very rapid. That affects us. The reason why we can get cheaper goods and so on is because of Chinese and other uh, productivity growth. But this shift of the global economy that I've mentioned, this globalization, has not been a triumph of the free market. Far from it. And that, again, is something we ought to be discussing the next couple of days, today and tomorrow. It's actually been a triumph of the state when you look at where rapid growth has been, China, first and foremost, and second, a triumph of multinationals. Multinationals control the global economy, control the global market. They are the main agents of globalization, make, um, have no doubt at all about it. That's the first point. Second point I want to make about the uh, transformation of the world is, of course, its financialization. It isn't just globalization, the world has also become financialized, and that is also something we're to be discussing today and tomorrow. Um, financialization is manifest in developed countries, mature countries, uh, Britain, the United States, France, and elsewhere. We all live through it. Finance penetrates every nook and cranny of economic and social life. But remarkably, financialization has become very, very prominent in developing countries as well, the last two decades. That's the most remarkable development in the last two decades, particularly middle-income countries. We see tremendous explosive growth of finance, and I don't just mean foreign capital coming in, foreign uh, liquid money uh, capital coming in, I mean domestic growth of finance, and I mean domestic implication of households and others with finance. It's incredible what's been happening in middle-income countries, Turkey, South Africa, uh, Mexico, and so on, and above all, in China, which is also peculiar with regard to financialization. It has its own domestic financialization, very different from elsewhere. The third point I want to make is that this global system, global financialized system, is of course marked by profound imbalance and instability. It's capitalism. There's no escaping it. It recreates imbalance and instability. First element of imbalance that I want to stress and we ought to be discussing is of course inequality. Tremendous inequality uh, within countries and between countries. Um, it's a feature of um, uh, the world we live in. Uh, and it's something that ought to concern the left profoundly, and it does concern the left profoundly. But related to that is, of course, a tendency to crisis. Um, it's, 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 it's paramount. This is a system that tends to crisis. Uh, and the clouds are again gathering. The clouds are gathering because debt has accumulated. And this time, the debt is not accumulating in the mature countries so much, but in the developing countries, precisely the areas that we'll be discussing um, today and tomorrow. Um, 
that's where the major risk to the world economy can be seen right now. Um, debt accumulated by big businesses, the multinationals of the middle-income countries, which have borrowed in um, foreign currencies, dollars, fundamentally, but operate in their own domestic currencies. The imbalance between the two is enormous. That's the major source of instability and weakness, potential danger at the moment. If that breaks out, then developed capitalist countries will also know it. It will impact uh, uh, the developed countries too. The country which is at the receiving end right now is, of course, Turkey. Turkey is the most dangerous terrain uh, right now for that kind of crisis which we're to be discussing. The fourth point I want to make, and I promise you I'm bringing it to an end, is of course that this is a system that rapes the environment. It isn't just inequitable uh, and unstable, but it rapes the environment. It treats the environment as foreign territory. It's there to be exploited and taken advantage of. Globalization of production has meant tremendous growth of transport, fossil fuels, and so on. The impact we all know is dramatic and puts the future of humanity at risk. So what to do? I hope we're going to get some answers today and tomorrow, or some ideas, what to do. Uh, but the first thing I want to stress, the initial thing I want to stress here, is that the answer is never just technical. You mustn't be looking for technical answers. It just doesn't exist. The answer must always be social. We must start from social relations, we must start from uh, working people and their needs and so on, and we must look for power and other relations that will allow us to change things. That's where things must start for, fr from. And there, the onus again falls on the left. Always. It's always like that. The onus falls on the left. Um, and I have two suggestions to make. When the left thinks about these things, as we're going to be doing here in this very important forum, it must start always, I think, with the domestic the domestic requirements. The change must start at the domestic, uh, in the domestic sphere, uh, the domestic terrain. We need control over the growth process. The left must propose programs, uh, means of controlling the, the domestic uh, growth proce process. This means public property. We need public property over key resources, key areas. It is impossible to do it otherwise. And it also means an integrated industrial policy. We need an industrial policy that will bring together energy, transport, housing, the key areas that affect live, lives and the performance of domestic economies. We need to propose how that's going to happen. It's not going to happen without industrial policy. It will not, it will not happen if you let it uh, at the discretion of private big business, private capital. Together with that, the left must be proposing measures to deal with corruption, which is... You find it across the board in the financialized world. Corruption, workers' rights, and related with that, of course, democracy. If you start with the social, if you start with social needs, you must always end up with democracy. There is no other way through which working people can protect their interests and project their own desires and wishes for uh, society. Democracy is paramount. So we start with the domestic, but then we go to the international. And there we must propose things for international arrangements too. We must propose things about the control of the global capital, finance, control of the foreign exchange, control of the banks, multinationals, tax, limit their activities, uh, multi multilateral institutions and what they do. It is for the left to come up with new ideas. I finish by saying that the left globally is in a rather weak position today because of what's happened the last 10 years. Britain is an exception. The Labour Party is in a historically unique position itself. It is incumbent upon it to find new ways, make new proposals. I welcome very much this initiative. I think that's exactly what is necessary. I hope that uh, Labour succeeds in proposing the domestic and international ideas that we need. And uh, I open this forum with pleasure. Thank you. Costas has just set out the manifesto, so we might as well all go home now. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thanks, Costas. That was really helpful. You can see why we've had the link up at SOAS over a period of time, and particularly, as he says, the...
economics department and the work that they've done for us in developing our ideas. So welcome to um, Labour's inaugural social forum. Um, at last year's Labour Party conference, I, well, we discussed many of the sort of global challenges and f threats that we now face. And we concluded that the current international system has left individuals, communities and even nation states increasingly powerless in the face of these threats and challenges. And the discussion we had, we concluded the system just isn't working either for the Western world, and it certainly isn't working for the global south either. So many of us have always, um, well, we've campaigned under the slogan to give people hope of another world is possible. Uh, and we increasingly recognise, I think, that to make that other world possible and other internationalism is possible. So I announced way back at the Labour Party conference that we would commence a dialogue on the common risks that we face and the threats that we face and to discuss the action we need to take. So I said we'd, we'd convene an international social forum and that's what this is. This is the start of a process and a dialogue starting this year and then building up to scale for next year. So let me just set the scene for the weekend's discussions. Um, from the initial discussions this weekend, we want to focus on, well, it's cost us to set it out for us, climate change, on global finance and accountability. We want to also discuss, as you've seen, the issues, the movement of people, migration, and also the challenges that we may face from trade and protectionism that has been developed, particularly with regard to since the election of Trump. Um, we want to hear in particular from the perspective of people from the global south, their assessment, in particular, the role of the international institutions. And we want to explore what we need to do to transform them. On climate change, look, uh, in May this year, we saw students in over 125 countries 1,600 cities walk out of their schools on strike to demand action on the climate emergency that threatens our very existence. And we supported those school strikes. We supported Extinction Rebellion's demonstrations. And we forced through Parliament, I think the first Parliament on the globe, the declaration of a global climate emergency. So in line with that, we've, just, we've prioritized in our discussion today the question of how global institutions are rising to the threat of climate change. And the reality is that for too long, the World Bank and the IMF have failed to throw their entire weight of their resources and expertise into tackling climate change. Yes, the IMF published a working paper this year mapping out global fossil fuel subsidies. But it then went on to turn a blind eye to these subsidies and has done for decades. So despite producing financial stability reports twice a year, it's been remarkably slow in identifying the change that's, well, the risk of climate change to financial stability overall. And the World Bank is, to be frank, if anything, more culpable. Uh, the Bretton Woods project pointed out that the bank continued to fund fossil fuel investments after 2015, uh, when it brought together the Paris Climate Agreement and yet ignored it. So-called environmental and social safeguards have fallen far short of all the stated goals. And turning to the WTO, WTO, well, the WTO is in crisis in many ways, including as a result of the US blocking of appointments to its appellate body. It's not done enough to ensure integration of trade measures and measures to combat climate change. And then if you turn to the Conference of the Parties, well, the Conference of the Parties process as part of the UN framework of the Convention on Climate Change is, well, the fact is the, we're coming up to the 25th anniversary of the Conference of the Parties meeting this year. And there's been inadequate pro progress on climate change. It's one of the features, I think, which is extremely telling. The COP process is still th seeking a robust enforcement mechanism to review countries' pledges as we risk, well, three degrees of warming by 2000 to 2100. The next century could see us threatened with our very existence, and yet the processes that we've put aside in terms of the institutional mechanisms and the debates have no sense of urgency or emergency. And the international mechanisms, despite the work, for example, of the Nansen Initiative and the platform Disaster Displacement, 
have completely failed to respond to the very challenge at the moment we're facing of climate displacement. I think inter intertwined with the challenge of climate change is, as Costas has said, the rise of the power of multinational corporations. Many of the world's worst emitters of fossil fuels are multinationals. And multinationals, whether through political lobbying, the use of investor state dispute settlements or other instruments, have chipped away at the power of states, individual states, to tackle climate change and also at their international endeavours. Our international order has failed to rise to the challenge of regulating and restraining the force of transnational corporations. And we see example after example, particularly in the global south, but also even within our own country. We still lack a binding international treaty on business and human rights. International investment agreements have given tools to private actors to reframe regulation extraordinarily as expropriation. And all too often international institutions have remained silent or indifferent to this creeping expansion of corporate power. And all of the international institutions I've mentioned can be criticised for failing to be democratic and representative. International agreements don't always undermine sovereignty. When states come together to reach agreement, they are exercising and pooling their sovereignty. But the work of the IMF, the World Bank and others have diminished the power of people across the globe, contributing to the lack of political agency, especially in the global south. We're witnessing the latest um, wielding of that power. There's a grotesque gentleman's agreement at the moment that the IMF and bank will be led by a European and usually an American. That's the gentleman's agreement that has produced for me and for many of us in this country the bizarre spectacle of George Osborne, the architect of UK austerity, sticking his hand up to be the next managing director of the IMF. God help us. <laughs> there are also structural agreement adjustment policies of the IMF which have forced privatisation and deregulation and fiscal consolidation on the global south. It was these policies that led Julius Nyeri, President of Tanzania, to asking, and I quote, when did the IMF become an international ministry of finance? And then there's the various groupings, self-selected, the G groupings, the G7, the G20, self-appointed and actually unrepresented shapers of policy. Jose Antonio Ocampo, former Minister of Finance of Colombia, has called this elite multilateralism. And naturally, we have the fear that Brexit will be another step towards undermining the genuine international cooperation that we need. Amidst all this, Acosta's referred to it rightly, of the rapacious greed which fossil fuel extraction is driving us to the edge of extinction now, our international institutions appear not just timid, but toothless. And worse still, I suppose, these institutions are not just inert. Time and time again, they favour the interests of the powerful. They, to, they tend to be tilted against the global south. Some have said that it's the states that are the individual states that are the root of the problem. Sometimes it may look that way. States cannot find consensus on climate change on, or the action needed, and that there's an inability to address climate change or multinational power is simply... Some say a failure of leadership, a product of too many divergent agendas. But I think I agree with Costas. The evidence is growing and a view is gathering promise that the problem is not states or states people. The problem is a system, a system, capitalism. It's a system that's prioritised the extraction of profit from people and the planet to enrich a particular class of people and disempowering most others. And the cause of our predicament has also historically been a, a form of colonial capitalism uh, that's underdeveloped the global south and at the same time has enriched the global north. And it's interesting, as we sit here in London, which has been a heart of empire in the past, we could, well, we are, we could do well to bear that history in mind and also bear in mind as a result of that what our responsibility is within the UK.
So this analysis of the present problems uh, stemming from capitalism is important. And it's more than just an academic analysis. The analysis is important because it affects how we see these challenges. It means, for example, we should see climate change as a class issue in terms of, of its effects, who it affects, but also how we manage, therefore, the just transition that we need. It means that we must all listen to those most effective, those on the front line. And it is the working class in the global south in particular that we need to listen to as we formulate our response. And this view of the world should affect the scale and the depth of our response. If the problem is systemic, just as Costas has said, technocratic tweaks will never be enough. Our response has to be unashamedly radical. So voluntary commitments that rely upon goodwill and good faith, to be frank, are profoundly inadequate, whether in the sphere of climate change or multinational power. We need also, alongside that, political responses, backed by force of law at the national and international level. What these political responses should be is one of the key discussions that we're going to have this weekend. Within the Labour Party in this recent period, um, we've sketched out a direction of travel in the shape of some of our commitments. And I've said that, for example, as part of our domestic green industrial revolution, technologies developed in the UK, particularly for the climate transition, must be made available free or cheap to the global south. We're consulting with tax experts in government how we might ensure fair taxation of multinationals so that multinationals are taxed in a way that reflect where their economic activity takes place and where their value is created. Jeremy Corbyn, my friend, the leader of the Labour Party, has committed us to supporting efforts that create, at long last, a binding, legally binding treaty on business and human rights, going beyond the existing voluntary principles. In another area, on overseas loan transparency, the G20 has expressed support for voluntary disclosure. I've said with Dan Carden, who's our Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, we will introduce an Overseas Loan Transparency Act when we go into government, requiring all loans to foreign governments to be registered if they're enforced, to be enforced in the UK for courts. Uh, one of our advisors, as you know, is Joe Stiglitz, and he wrote a report back in 2009 on reforming the international monetary and financial system. He called in that report for the creation of a new body, which he called a Global Economic Coordination Council. That body would sit at the level of a UN General Assembly and the Security Council. It would be a globally representative forum, replacing the unrepresentative G20. It would coordinate the UN system across the economic, but also social and environmental fields. It would bring the WTO, currently in crisis, formally into the UN system. Jose Antonio Campo, whose work we've drawn upon in developing our own National Investment Bank for the UK, and Joe Stiglitz both expanded on the proposal more recently. And they said that the Global Economic Coordination Council could play a role in identifying spillovers and finding gaps in existing cooperation. By spillovers, what they mean is challenges that spill across countries as well as across international institutions that currently, in their view, and I agree, work in specific silos. I think it's a proposal that, work, that does merit serious consideration and will be part of our discussions today in our, our coming dialogue. And we should continue to discuss whether existing proposals for the Council do achieve the full representation of the Global South as well. So a new global architecture would have to approach the IMF and the bank's activities differently and in a way that avoids duplication. It would have to be underpinned by principles, democracy, solidarity and equality. It would have to recognise the need to centre the voices of the global south in a way that they've not been before. In the year 2022, it will be 30 years since the Rio Earth Summit and the halfway mark in progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, which were set in 2015 and were meant to be met by 2030. That could be a moment 
where major decisions are made about transformation necessary to make the international institutions actually fit for purpose again. Quentin Slobodin has just demonstrated in his book Globalist many international agreements and institutions were given a right-wing orientation through the subtle and ambiguous work of thinkers, lawyers and statespeople. Those of us who aspire to a, a different order will need to similarly work to reshape our international settlement, but in a less top-down way. We need good ideas as well as you know, methodologies for unleashing the power of people. People who push back against the current form of neoliberal globalisation often are painted as sort of reactionary nationalists. The suggestion is that there can only be two sides, defenders of the existing right-wing globalisation and xenophobic nationalists. We have to reject that false depiction. I believe that we have the potential for and must assert that another internationalism is possible to achieve that goal of another world being possible. It's the internationalism of um, Angela Davis. Some of you may have seen her when she came across and spoke at the South Bank two years ago. She said recently that we need an internationalist framework within which the ongoing work to dismantle the structures of racism heteropatriarchy and economic injustice can become more enduring and more meaningful for people. And it's, a, it's a new internationalism that combines, yes, the, the high principles that we have, but also a hard-nosed pragmatism about implementation. An, impl an internationalism that sees the world as it is and sets out unflinchingly to change it. At the um, 1955 Bandon Conference, uh, it was a key moment in the history of decolonization and the first Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Nero, said, and I quote, we're thinking and acting in terms of a past age. I think those words ring true today. We're still thinking and acting as if we have not seen the neoliberal destruction of our economies and societies that's occurred over the last 40 years. We're still thinking and acting as if we haven't just felt well, the hottest June on record in this country. We, we need, in Nero's words, to look at the world as it is today. And that's the task for all of us in the next couple of days. Um, in a year's time, we want a programme developed by you and others that will bring it into this debate and that politicians can sign up to in order to build that new form of internationalism. So through this weekend's plenaries and workshops, we hope you'll all contribute to developing that programme. It's a huge task, but we have to start somewhere. And we believe that start is today. We have, we have amongst you all a range of people who are, yes, some politicians, economists, environmentalists, leaders of social movements, campaigners on particular causes. But all of you are invited because of your display of solidarity over time. And we believe that on the basis of that solidarity, we can develop that programme, unleash the movement that we need, not just in individual countries, but internationally and globally, to develop that another internationalism. Thank you very much. We had a long discussion about how we can construct this agenda and how we could bring individuals together. And then we went headhunting around the world um, to bring together people with their different expertise. And you'll see from the plenaries and the workshops, I think we've been immensely successful. And so I want to introduce to you our, our first speaker. Uh, I never thought she'd come, but I'm really pleased she has. And it's Dilma Rousseff. So, uh, I just before uh, before before she speaks. Let me. Just, this is not a CV. This is a novel. Okay, let me, a Brazilian economist, a politician who served as the 36th president of Brazil.
holding the position from 2011 to 2016, she was the first woman to hold the Brazilian presidency. She became a socialist in her youth and after the 64 coup d'etat joined left-wing and Marxist urban guerrilla groups that fought against the military dictatorship. She was captured, tortured, jailed from 70 to 1972 and then came through that to serve her country. This is a heroine, Dilma Rousseff. Good morning. I would like to thank you, to welcome everyone here and everybody who has honored me, and thank the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, the other debaters from South Africa, the USA, and India. I would like to thank the Labour Party for organizing this forum and the University of SOAS for being able to do this conference here. Brazil is undergoing a very atypical situation, so as not to say tragic. Over a year ago, I was here in London, and I asked the press when I was interviewed, to investigate what was happening in Brazil. Because there was a narrative war whose object was to hide the implementation of an exception, state of exception, which was taking place in Brazil. Investigate, I asked. And today, I thank the press the progressive uh, press and all the citizens of the UK who have contributed to the fight for the truth and democracy in Brazil by denouncing the coup and lawfare. They have helped to break the barrier that the oligarchian media in Brazil had erected against this process so as to hide the coup-mongering characteristics against democracy in Brazil. We know that the first victim of any conflict is truth. Both in traditional wars and the so-called hybrid wars or political conflicts, they start by disdaining and distorting facts and truths. And in Brazil, it was no different. The first victim of the parliamentary coup in 2016 and of the trial and the conviction without crime and without proof of President Lula and his removal of the 2018 elections was not only democracy, but truth. Lies are born from the defeat of 2014 of my second term. In face of the defeat, of my adversaries, my opponents, who up to that time had been democ uh, Democrats. They were center-right, but demo they were based on the center-right, but were democratic. And from that moment, where they become coup mongers, the lies emerge from the defeat and an attempt to hide the fact that there was a coup. And also, by the fact that the coup is not an act, an inaugural act that is the impeachment. That is just the beginning, but an impeachment is not enough. How to maintain this coup-mongering project if we could come back in 2018? So the second act was to arrest, convict uh, President Lula and take him out of the elections. And why this? The main aim was to put Brazil in its place. 
both in socially, economically and geopolitically, especially within the standards of neoliberalism. We have a very atypical situation in Brazil, where from one, one side we could say that we had a process that was incomplete, a partial process of neoliberal reforms in all the social economic sphere in Brazil. But the successive defeats from the election of President Lula in 2003, there was three consecutive elections where the neoliberal project was defeated. We had a regulated labor market. We had three public uh, banks, the largest trading commercial bank. We had the largest uh, mortgage bank and the largest investment bank with a funding slightly larger than the World Bank. We also had the large state companies and the environment was regulated. We had land policies and indigenous policies that were taking place. And Brazil had a very su a reasonably successful um, policy for combating hunger. We created 21 million jobs. We had a growth of, 20, of 77 percent in the min, min, minimum salaries. 14 million people, uh, 14 million families with social protection which go beyond those people who receive protection um, from Social Security, especially when people were ill. And at the same time, we had a growing infrastructure. For example, sewage, which reduced uh, problems in public health. So why, after all this works, we got to a coup? This is what I'm trying to explain by saying that Brazil was put in its place for a number of reasons. There are very many forces came together in order to do this. This desire from the market for neoliberal reform come together with the people who were defeated in the elections. And this tempted them towards a coup. And then we have the development of a process where neoliberalism becomes viable through only through a far-right uh, government. Otherwise, this wouldn't have been possible. And a far-right government means lawfare, a coup d'etat, and the destruction of the center-right party, which also take place in the coup and are destructed by the monster that they themselves created in that they will be absolutely defeated in the election and leave only us, the Workers' Party, and the movement embodied by the far right, by Bolsonaro. And if this is possible, it is only because we have the combination of two forces. On one side, the forces that sustain neoliberalism and financiarization, and on the other, the forces that sustain a proposal of a society that is conservative, based on hatred, intolerance, and violence. And that is why the rise of the far right and the imposition of neoliberal reforms 
ela no Brasil tem essa característica. They have this characteristic in Brazil. They do not happen within liberal democracy as it took place in Europe and in many other places in the world. It takes place only and exclusively based on a process of destruction of democracy and building a, a state of exception. And this is slow and this is gradual. It doesn't happen at once. Even because we don't need the street so much, we have another process, a very different process from what had been happening in Latin America. In Brazil, we're experiencing this late rise of neoliberalism. We are perhaps the only country in Latin America who up to that time have managed to maintain intact all its state structure as a mechanism for social development with inclusion. Argentina, for example, had had the state apparatus which was built in the 60s and 70s, 50s and 60s, 70s, and they saw this being destroyed, its largest oil company in the 1970s, uh, the largest one in Latin America was, Argeni uh, was Argentina, YPF. It was very similar to the Mexican oil company and the Venezuelan uh, uh, company. Now it hardly exists. The same thing we can see in this loss of mechanisms in all the other Latin American uh, countries. And Brazil was the only country that had these instruments intact. Because the reforms that happened here during Thatcher and Reagan in Brazil, we tried in a similar period, but didn't manage to go through our blockage due to the fact that in Brazil, the level of social inequality was very high and there was an economic crisis. So when Lula came to power and the continuity of the workers' parties for four consecutive man uh, mandates, we managed to bar these reforms. And a number of factors now leads us to the need for a far right, especially because the actors or the people who did the coup are part of the traditional center-right, our traditional opponents. And during this process, they open the Pandora box and are destroyed because their monsters first devour the people who open those boxes. The difference of Brazil from Europe is that here, neoliberalism, came within the framework of democracy, maintaining the rule of law, the rule of law, despite the fact that some of the democratic characteristics were compromised with time because of the growth of inequality, which I think is the most marking characterism of neoliberalism. The emergence of the far right here does have some similarities with Brazil because it has the same base, it's neoliberalism. But here, we also have the emergence of another side of neoliberalism, which is, as we can see, the growth of inequality becomes even more difficult to impose and maintain a democratic framework, which is not compromised. And this means that both economically, by imposing financialization, and by seeing the concentration of wealth in the hands of those who don't produce and speculate and impose a reduction in salaries, 
and income. We see the development of an environment that enables the growth of far right within the framework of democracy differently from our framework. But at the same time, the far right is giving alternatives and answers to the reality, which if the left doesn't act, we will see the inexorable growth of the far right. Therefore, it is important to understand not only the effects of neoliberalism, but the imposition of austerity measures after the 2008 crisis, which have also contributed for the discredit and disillusion that we're going through at the moment. Of course, the, the, the most evident characteristics of the emergence of the far right, which is violence, hatred, lawfare in our case and in the case of Latin America in general, and all the policies uh, of intolerance, of misogynism, emerge in all countries where we have the far right. And I believe that some of, our, of the rise of, the, of this process in, our, in my own country, it requires, we require to pay a lot of attention to the growth of the far right. First of all, the bringing together and the organization of the far right at a global level. It is very clear in Brazil the importance and the influence of the thinking of the American far right, both in the armed forces and in part of the neo-fascist part of the Bolsonaro government. Also, the dissemination of this persecution climate which the lawfare brought along. And I will talk a little bit later about the lawfare as a means of attacking um, politics by using the law. You no longer use arms, but you use law. And it is very important to um, highlight this. The use, the distorted use of social media and the use of fake news, which substitute the political meetings and even the television, which uh, have now been substituted by the social media, not just in Brazil, but as we have seen in India and in other countries especially in the, also as we can see in the parliamentary elections in Europe. And we can see the corrosion of the political system through the generalized suspicion of political parties as a source of degradation, where they're trying to make politics into something that is inherently dishonest. And especially in, the, in terms of Brazil, the, this emergence of militias and paramilitary groups which are responsible for the death of a councillor, Marielle Franco, and her driver. But what we know is that there are over 70 deaths of militants of various uh, levels did happen because of these parliamentary uh, elements. And this is also very central in terms of controlling populations, especially the marginalized populations in the large per peripheries of cities, in places where the state went in but came out when, and they now control housing, access to transport and other public goods. 
I believe that in Brazil we need to analyze very responsibly, especially this rise of violence in Brazil, differently from the period in the dictatorship where the state was the main force that used violence against any other forces. Today, we have something else. We have para paramilitary forces which emerge trying to control what before was controlled by the state. These are assassin groups, murdering groups. They are like the black shirts from um, the fascist and Nazi times. And their objective is to introduce violence as a way of resolving conflicts and politics, and also to bring fear to their opponents. Lawfare, on the other hand, as a political weapon, has become generalized in Latin America. Even if it wasn't used, like in Argentina, it wasn't used um, to, for coups, but it has been used against Cristina Kirchner. In Ecuador, it has been used against the former president of Ecuador, Correa. And in Peru, it left to the suicide of Alan Garcia. In Brazil, lawfare was institutionalized and used against President Lula to, together with impeachment, to open the way so that the far right could win the elections. Lawfare within the Brazilian context constitutes in the use and the distortions of all the resources of the judicial system and legislation to persecute and defeat political opponents. It seeks to destroy the public image of leaders, of the left-wing leaders. As the government says, it, it destroys all the skins of citizenship, of, of uh, social origin, of participation in organizations and parties, and leave just you uh, naked and produces political inability, the immobilization of political opponents. The main extreme press in Brazil had a very strategic role in this lawfare. It disdained the presumption of innocence and the, uh, the due legal process and converted itself as, as, as if it was the fourth level of the judiciary that was con uh, convicting without listening to the other side. It was simply disseminating without a, the listening to the adversary side through this persecutory legal system, which we can see is being demoralized by the leaks made by the Intercept Brazil, a site uh, by Gren Greenwald, which also revealed the leaks that came out uh, through Snowden. Here, he reveals the central workings of lawfare, which is accusing without any substance, with the aim and by means of distortion of law, criminalizing, to ensure the criminalization of political opponents. Judicial processes are proposed without any base, except for the reason to discredit opponents. Pre President Lula systematically suffered through this. At some points, he had almost 13 processes against him, and they were eventually reduced due to a total lack of substance.
At the same time, it neutralizes and silences the opponent, uh, opponent by, mean, by criminalizing them. And in this way, they are removed from the political scenario. In the case of President Lula, after he was convicted, as he continued to be high on the polls before the elections, he, was, he, had, he started with 32, 33 percent, for example. They decided that convicting him wasn't enough. They had to take him out of the elections by convicting him at the second level, which is done in a very surprisingly quick way, because it's absolutely mathematically impossible to read the number of processes in such small amount of time. This deconstruction process was absolutely essential to remove President Lula from the election. And how did they do this? First of all, by changing the understanding of an article of the Constitution, which would have been to only be able to arrest some or to put somebody in prison when they have gone through all their legal resources in every single level of the judiciary. Secondly, they silence him because he's not allowed to talk to the press, because if he spoke to the press, it was possible that his substitute would be able to win the elections. So in order to stop him, um, uh, lawfare is used to the extreme. We knew all this in Brazil. All this came through and, and, and made everybody and every single person in the political system and in academia knew about this. But when the intercept disseminates the conversations between Judge Sergio Moro and the public prosecutors, then we can have the substance of this. And what sort of thing did we see being published? Some of them are very serious. First of all, it shows the, the car wash in operation, which has this element of combating uh, corruption, which has another aspect as well, which is law far. It is true that they have indeed uh, put some corrupt people in present, and it is myself and Lula who gave power to the police to investigate and put in place the legislation for this investigation. But the distortion of this practice, it cannot be justified based on, combat, on the combating and the fighting against corruption. One thing is combating corruption, the other is the distortion of the car wash corporation. And the intercept shows that these conversations it, where you have public, prosecution, uh, public prosecutors speaking through the platform telegram with certain audience, which shows something very difficult. First of all, the political partiality of both the prosecutor and the just political partiality, because they say that they cannot allow President Lula to give interviews, because otherwise the Workers' Party could win the election. They say that absolutely clearly. So we have the politicization of, pol of um, justice, which is unacceptable in a democracy. Second, the rule, uh, the judge becomes an, an, an accuser. He becomes hierarch hierarchically superior to the public prosecutors. In Brazil, differently from here in the UK, we don't have two judges, one that instructs and one that judges. We have just one judge that does both things. So we need to be very careful with the neutrality of the just, because he also instructs and he judges. This is a problem in Brazilian legislation. That's why it is very serious 
when you see this judge that becomes an accuser. Not only does he become an accuser, he orientates, he guides the public prosecutors. He tells off some of the pro, uh, public prosecutors and said, this order that you've got, the order of the investigation is wrong. Or he says, you need to interrogate this witness. He tells the public prosecutor, be careful because one of your public prosecutors who is interrogating Lula is not so competent. Take her away, remove her from the investigation. The level of interference of the judge shows not only a complicity, but almost a hierarchical line between the judge and the public prosecutors. And even worse, it shows that the, the, the next level of courts were also having conversations which weren't exactly appropriate with the public prosecutors. In other words, an acceptable consultation in the fact that if we th that the judge needs to be impartial. And all this compromises the process and the investigations and leaves the lack of proofs against Lula very evident because they very clearly say proofs against President Lula are weak. We do not know if we are able to accuse him. But then they force, force them to accuse him. And this weak accusation was basically a report from the newspaper or Globe. In other words, there's absolutely no proof. And this whole process is now being leaked drop by drop. And I highlight this because this is absolutely essential for us to understand what is happening in Brazil today. We have a very serious problem, which is not a problem with President Lula. It's a problem that relates to the judicial problem, the system of justice within a democracy. And when we have a judiciary that is being questioned, we have a very serious risk of institutional crisis. And this is what's taking place in Brazil today. Everything is, we have an open vision. We can see clearly what is happening in, this, in the judicial vision. And this is even worse when we have a systematic practice on the side of neo-fascism fascism, that suddenly emerges with Bolsonaro, where they defend the closing of the Congress and of the Supreme Court. In whichever circumstances that come up, they propose the closing of Congress and the Supreme Court. The son of the president says that all you need is a couple of soldiers to close the Supreme. This is very serious because it affects the institutions of the country. So we have a situation which is very serious. And what happens to the system that is sustaining this government? Who is sustaining this government? Some sectors of the right and of the centre-right are still backing this government. Some sectors of the armed forces, which have come from this tradition of authoritarianism, and also the parties which support, especially some center parties which are supporting the government. And what is the reason for supporting this government, even from market sectors, which in theory should have been liberal? Parts of the business elite for example, is the supposition that uh, Bolsonaro's government will 
deliver the neoliberal agenda. And if it does, it will be possible for us to look on the other side some of his neo-fascist tendencies, hoping that he might be moderated, co-opted and tutored. In the last six months, however, we can see that there is no moderation chip in a neo-fascist project. There is no moderation chip. It is, it, ha, it grows, and it has shown this systematically. More and more, it redefines the profile of the government. And at the same time, in terms of our foreign policy, it breaks every single pattern which of foreign policy the Brazil represented throughout its history, and especially in the last 13 years, where we gave a lot of importance to Latin America, to Africa, because we are the second largest black country in the world. If we consider even countries in Africa, we're only smaller than Nigeria. So our foreign policy was looking towards Africa. And it has a very an important point because it takes us back to our roots. And the development of the BRICS, perhaps one of the most worst things that Brazil has done to be able to participate in the formation of Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa, the South African bloc, because traditionally that wasn't the multilateral alignment of Brazil. Brazil shouldn't be a multilateral country in terms of its foreign relations. It could only have been linked to the USA. That was our practice until some time ago. We had some periods during the, the military period when this didn't happen. But it was a fleeting moment. But we, we had an, in, an autonomous and independent foreign policy, which was all fundamentally multilateral, but also a foreign policy that sought strategically to have relations with some blocs, taking into account that for us it was important to have relationship with the USA, of course, with Europe, Japan and Asia. Today, Bolsonaro's foreign policy is a blind alignment not only to the USA policy, but to Trump's policy. This leads us to very serious problems, such as trying to transfer the Brazilian embassy to Jerusalem, which is very complicated in Brazil because it affects the interests of the agribusiness in Brazil, which produces protein for the Middle East. A policy of isolation or approximation at other times, an ambiguous um, policy in relation to other countries in the world. And it's a very sad moment of Brazilian diplomacy. And now we have the threat of Bolsonaro's son being nominated um, ambassador of Brazil, of Brazil in the USA next to Olavo de Carvalho, who is far, far, far right. So we have a very dramatic situation. What is at play here? There are a number of things which are at stake. First of all, which I think is very serious, we can see a change in the environmental policy of Brazil. We can see the violation of all the protections, which is accelerated and radical in terms of the environment in Brazil. We have deregulation, not only 
where you break legislation and regulations, but you destroy the policy of indigenous and environmental reserves, and you free uh, access to land to foreigners without any restriction. Therefore, we're talking about something very serious. We're talking about the deforestation in the Amazon, which increased 88% in June when you compare it to last year. This is already terrible because last year it was really bad because the government that succeeds me, which is illegitimate, do the, take some of the regulation from the environment away as well. On top of this, you free, you, you take away the monitoring which leads to a growth in deforestation, not only the 88%, but it shows that we can have far more um, deforestation in the future. It makes people who act uh, for the environment and indigenous groups um, more vulnerable to violence, to very radical violence, and at the same time, you can see a total disdain for everything that was built in Brazil in the last 30 years. We built during those times a policy uh, of co uh, forestry code, of reservations, alternative energies based on biodiesel. And in between 2004 and 2008, we reduced deforestation in the Amazon by 75%. In 2009, we went to COP15, and we were the country the first presented a voluntary reduction of 36% in greenhouse gases, and also a reduction in deforestation. All this is going, is going to be destroyed, especially we were there in the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Bolsonaro government refuses, imitating um, Trump's government, to comply with this agreement. He is ambiguous towards it. He says that he is not going to comply with it, but he hasn't really gone towards not complying with it. But the situation is very serious because Brazil was one of the countries that led internationally the development of these agreements. It is also destroying the environmental councils. It's destroying the mechanisms that civil society has to supervise the environment and social, um, um, the social area. And people need to participate actively in the policies to combat the destruction of the forest in preserving the environment and preserving the indigenous lands. So these people need to be participating. They need to be active in relation to this. And it's important to know that the preservation and protected areas in Brazil, forests, indigenous lands and biodiversity areas are over 3.7 million square kilometers, 11 times larger than the size of the UK. We're talking about a land that's 3.7 kilometers squared of land. Also in Brazil, we are going through violent deregulation of labor. We have seen a very large reduction. Until 2017, we had, had not seen any deregulation in the labor market, in labor relations in Brazil. All our gains of the labor uh, classes, of the working classes were maintained. And then we have a large reduction of labor regulations leading to precarious work 
and the loss of rights. In the last week, they proposed the revocation of all the rights, all the labor rights, which are written in the labor registration, including unemployment benefit, so long as there is unemployment. So, so long as there is unemployment and we don't get to full employment, you're going to get uh, to remove every single labor right in Brazil, which is absolutely crazy. It, it becomes something stupid, something crazy. It's something that you cannot imagine. It weakens in the same way as it happened here, the power of the unions by also removing financing of uh, the um, unions. So there's no, and you almost end the role of the labor courts that has always been there to bring back the, ba the balance between workers and employment. And you open to the financial markets all the funds that come from labor in Brazil. And we have, this is almost a huge economy that the country has. They are massive funds that have always been used for social policies in Brazil. And these funds will now be open, which are voluntary savings for the worker they become resources for funding financial speculation. It's important to say that in Brazil, that as well as financiarization, we also have our own financial ghost, which is the fact that we have a very extreme uh, monopoly system in our banking system. We've only got four large banks where they control 90% of the market. And so it has one of the largest spreads in the country. A credit card can charge 200%, which is a considered loan. Loans for the industrial and agricultural sectors are around 150%, uh, and that is considered low. Financial speculation based on the rolling of the Brazilian debt is very high. It's important to say that Brazil has 380 billion in reserves. It doesn't have any ex exchange rate uh, problems. We paid the, uh, the IMF, and we've accumulated 380 billion dollars of funds. So we don't have a, uh, an exchange rate crisis, which has been happening in Argentina under Macri with a loan of. $56 billion uh, to Argentina, which will make the Argentinian debt unpayable. It's already, it was already difficult to pay. President Cristina Kirchner managed to negotiate 90% of the, of the debt, and there was 10% that depended on new uh, um, negotiations with the vulture funds. But now we have a further 56 million to be repaid. Brazil doesn't have an exchange rate crisis. We the Workers' Party received the country with a huge international debt. We paid all our debt. All our international debt is in Brazilian reais. So we do not have any exchange rate problems. Our problems are fiscal problems. And we have done a serious problem which is the austerity uh, policies in Brazil, which have come to such an extent where you have in our budget our fiscal anchor, saying that we can only have expenditure, uh, real expenditure, sorry. In other words, we have zero growth. Furthermore, they're going to privatize the largest seventh, uh, the seventh largest company in the country. They're going to start selling it in parts. 
the, by selling the com uh, the fuel com the Brazilian fuel company part of Petrobras. They've sell sold Embraer, uh, aviation company, to Boeing, which was our largest competitor. They used to do small jets. And they also developed a cargo uh, jet called Cassette 90. The problem in Brazil is that this giving of Brazil to privatization is very serious because Brazil has a lot to give. It, Brazil went from the 14th largest uh, economy in 2002 to the seventh largest economy. Brazil is no longer seventh but it's still not the 10th. And Brazil still has a lot to give up. And this is a process of prioritization of the Brazilian economy. It's a country where people don't know that it does a number of activities, but it's a country that has huge, vast amount of land. It has one of the largest uh, export, export uh, um, agriculture, but it also has a very sophisticated sector of weapons, for example. And this process of selling Brazil unbalances the world internationally. Petrobras oil reserves are the largest in the world. Pre-salt was the largest reserve discovered after 2006 in the world. There were no largest oil reserves discovered in Brazil. And we started to produce over 1.3 million barrels taking oil from very deep waters and they're giving, they're selling all this as well. And this is a shame because this was our passport for the future. It's why we had resources to invest on education. And Brazil needs education. It needs education to ensure that people get out of poverty forever. So you need to educate your country with quality. And for this, you need resources. Secondly, we need to ensure a leap towards a knowledge economy. If we have no access to technology in the next few years, especially in terms of artificial intelligence, we're going to be, a sub, are going to be submissive countries. And third, because we need culture and learn culture is associated to democracy, the formation of conscious citizens. We are at a point, and I'm going to stop here, Lula's freedom is essential in two aspects. First, in a democratic way, because uh, uh, we have, and Lula's head does everything that fell in terms of the state of exception in Brazil, but also because of everything that the, the, Bolson, the Bolsonaro government is doing. Lula's government and the PT governments are in the hearts and the minds of part of the working people and part of the middle class in Brazil, because Brazil is divided. We were not defeated strategically in these elections. We managed to get 45% of the votes and 47 million votes. It was one of the only parties that survived because the so-called party of the now president is something casual. It doesn't actually, it is not actually a party. So it is very important that President Lula leaves prison. And this cannot take the 20 years that it took Mandela to be freed. That is why I would like to thank all of you and ask all of you. We know that we will only be able to change the Brazilian scenario if we are 
everywhere in the working places in the in, in the places of cultures in all places in all the aspects of social life but we also know that it's important to gain some certain things in the short terms and one of them is without a doubt the freedom of president lula which is very difficult from the legal term, in legal terms, to justify Lula's imprisonment. And more and more this will become evident. We can see that Carl Wash or operations is compromised for two questions. The first is the Juiz Sergio Moro accepted to become Minister of Justice for the person that he benefited by putting Lula in prison. And secondly, is that they did an agreement with the American Justice Department where the American Justice Department would give 80% of its fine that it was applying to Petrobras to Brazil. And to whom in Brazil? But the people who received in the Brazilian government was the car wash operation which created a foundation which is worth around more or less two million dollars in exchange of providing re systematic reports on the state of, Petro of Petrobras. This is a lot of money for the public prosecutors of Petrobras and very little for paying for information on the seventh largest oil company in the world. I can tell you that I was the object. Of uh, telephone tapping of the NSA of the USA, the same agency that tapped Angela Merkel to be able to obtain the secrets of the Brazilian Petrobras, which now the car wash operation transfers for two million dollars which is absolutely absurd. As the Americans would say, this is peanuts for the Petrobras and a lot of money for the car wash investigation. It's important to say that from this scandal, the general public prosecutor canceled this agreement, but this also brought shame onto the car wash investigation. I think it is very serious the problem of the far right today. And I think the reasons that the far right is there is because we, it, and because of the structure, we need to give uh, alternatives to the population. Every time we give no alternatives to the population, the far right appears because they provide solutions. In Brazil, it makes it easy for us because the solutions that they're giving are absolutely ridiculous. So he loses, Bolsonaro loses support. But the far right is not always absurd. So much so, as, 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 or as absurd as Bolsonaro's government. And that is why I believe that you need to look at Brazil not just because of solidarity, but because Brazil is an extreme case of the alliance between neoliberalism and far right. Thank you very much. Dilma for that exposition which was superb and detailed and enlightening of the climate that's working or political climate in Brazil at the moment. I'd like to introduce now Jayati Ghosh. She is a development economist and professor of economics at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning and School of Social Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India.
And we were really keen to ask Giotti to come across because we, she functions on the specialities that we're now trying to discuss this weekend and globalization, international finance, employment patterns in developing countries, macroeconomic policy, and the issues related to the gender and development, all the issues that we want to build our program on from discussions today and to the rest of this year. Um, Jayati Gosh. Thank you very much. It's really a great honor and a privilege to be part of this panel. And I'm, I'm delighted that there is this coming together of, of progressive people who are trying to develop alternatives because at no point in, in the recent future can I remember being, being so absolutely essential. I think we've already got a, a fascinating and excellent summary of the problems. And as I was listening just now to Til Marusef, it, there were so many parallels uh, with what is happening in India and in many other countries. But also I think it reminds us that imperialism is alive and well and is uh, rearing its ugly head all over the place. I think what is more important for us to remember, or perhaps <laughs> this fits in with what Costas was saying about the shift in the balance of power in the world, is that uh, for a change, it's the developing countries which are showing the developed countries an image of their own future. I hate to say this, but welcome to the third world. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, really, you know, uh, despite all that talk of the elephant graph and all these workers in the South doing so much better because <laughs> of globalization and China and India having this fantastic time and so on, that actually things are pretty bad in most of the developing world, including the so-called success stories. Uh, many of the problems that you face here, we have been facing for a longer time and in a worse way because at lower levels of per capita income. It's not just material insecurity, jobless growth, uh, the desecration and destruction of the environment, uh, climate change, it's not just coming for us, it's upon us. This year's monsoon, there have been parts of India that have had, it's been raining sand not water. We are talking about very, very severe impacts on the environment. We are talking about extreme inequality, which is growing even more and worsening as we speak, which in turn is unleashing the worst possible social forces. We already heard Dilma Rousseff tell us about neo-fascism in Brazil. I can tell you that there are equally unpleasant, possibly more unpleasant forms occurring in India today uh, with the explicit patronage of the state and global capital and local national large capital. So this coming together of large capital of the worst possible political tendencies, many of which bring the uh, patina of so-called change. They talk about uh, delivering change from the kinds of neoliberal uh, tendencies we've seen in the past, and they do this on the basis of developing arguments of the other that what's been going on is really because you've got migrants or you've got Muslims or you've got dark people or you've got whatever, some other. So what we have is a very, it's not just, I mean, I think John McDonald put it very well, that it is the system which is at fault, but it's a particular phase and form of the system. It is a particular plutocratic patrimonial patriarchal phase of the system, which is expressed in financialization, absolutely, as Costas mentioned, but it's also expressed in a range of other new monopolies, which we haven't seen before and which are having implications that we haven't fully understood. So the growth of the digital companies, their ability to penetrate every element of our lives and know everything about us, their extreme complicity with large capital of other kinds and with the state in forms of monitoring and surveillance that I can tell you in India we are already feeling the implications of and my friends in China are certainly feeling the implications of. All of these are things which are irrecoverably changing the nature of our societies. And if we don't do something about it now, it may well be too late. What's happening today is that neoliberal capitalism is fundamentally incompatible with democracy. Fundamentally. And if we want to preserve democracy in any form, we really have to demolish this beast uh, before it's too late. Now, it may seem that it's just too big and too large and too impossible <laughs> because it's 
as I just mentioned, they, they control every part of our lives. They've also got us into finance. They've tied our hands in every possible way. Our pension funds are us, and so on and so forth. All of this seems that it's just impossible to, uh, to change. I think, in fact, it's these periods when it seems the most constraining, the most impossible, when actually the chinks begin to appear. And that's largely because, in a way, Capitalism has got too powerful for its own good. It's destroyed all its opponents. It has, the predator has eaten all the prey. And you know what happens to predators who eat all the prey? They starve. Uh, at the, that's, the stagnation we're seeing is that starvation of capitalism, which is that it's really run out. I mean, the complete absence of sources of demand in the system. Uh, the countries that relied on export-led growth are not finding that growth. The inability of the state to generate on its own, any sources of independent demand. And everybody looking at others saying, well, we can somehow find that demand there. That's one of the indications that this is a system that has just grown too powerful for its own good or for its own viability, or I hope for its own longevity. Now, that means that there are, in fact, these chinks, these open spaces that we have to seize. But these are not spaces that are going to just on their own dissolve. In fact, if anything, they fight back, as we have seen in Brazil. The empire fights back big time. Um, we have seen it in India. We are seeing it in many, many other countries, this weird combination of what is called populist. But I mean, I, I think it's just basically the politics of hate, which is spread throughout different groups in society. We are seeing it in India, we're seeing it in the Philippines, we're seeing it in Egypt, we're seeing it all over. We're not seeing it just uh, uh, here. And it's come to Europe. As I said, welcome <laughs> to this not very pleasant third world. But it is possible to change. And I think there are already ideas in different parts of the world to change it. Sometimes in, in England, I know there have been, there's been talk of a Green New Deal. Uh, which has many of the ideas and arguments which I believe are valid in different parts of the world as well. In the United States, they talk of a Green New Deal, which is much more, shall we say, inward looking. But you can't do this alone. You have to do this globally. It cannot be done individually. <laughs> and if we can just remind ourselves, what are those elements of that New Deal which are so important still for all of us, for us in India, for people in Pakistan, for people in, in South Africa, for people everywhere in the world, they were essentially a state-led recovery, redistribution and regulation of markets. We really have to bring back all of those elements. We need a massive public investment push, certainly in green investments, in the care economy, in all these things which are deeply employment generating as it happens and which will have very strong multiplier effects which will actually cause much more generation of employment and therefore better labor market conditions and therefore more effective demand and so on and so forth. We need much more regulation of markets, not just all markets, certainly financial markets are number one on the list, but we also need regulation of the big digital companies. We need regulation of a whole range of multinational enterprises that have gone beyond the pale in terms of both control and ability to exploit the system. We need taxation of those. And there is low hanging fruit out there in terms of the possibilities of the unitary taxation of multinationals. Believe it or not, the IMF and the OECD are talking about this possibility for digital companies. In other words, everybody's waking up to the fact that multinational corporations today are able to get away with paying about 3% of the tax that they should be paying, on average. We're not even talking about the big guys who I think don't even pay 3%. So these are possibilities that even the most, shall we say, staunch supporters of the old order are beginning to recognize have to be done. So that kind of regulation is essential. Taxation is also significant for the redistributive requirement. We must have this big public investment push. That means we must have public resources. That means we must take those resources from those who have been creaming it off the system for the last 25 years in unprecedented ways. And that is possible. We can begin with those, the taxation of the multinationals, but some simple regulations in different countries, they need very, very small changes 
in regulation would actually leave much, much more in terms of public resources to invest in the things that matter for people, to invest in the regeneration in, of our cities, to invest in the recovery of an ecological agriculture in most of the developing world, to invest in the things that make life worth living, not just the care economy, but creative activities and a whole range of other things. There is so much that needs to be done, there is so much work that needs to be done, that it is unbelievable that workers cannot find jobs. So we really need to bring all of that back so that anyone who drops in from Mars 10 years from now doesn't say, my God, are all the people in this world crazy? You know, I mean, we really, there is so much that is obvious that needs to be done and can be done. The big constraint today, it's not just our domestic politics. Sure, our domestic politics are a constraint. But the big constraint is international architecture. And I'm so delighted that uh, John McDonnell has brought in this international element to your economic discussions. Because just as you can't do it alone, none of us can do it alone. But even all of us together can't do it in the current international regime. We really have to change this international architecture. So in, while Mr. Trump is out there destroy, taking a hatchet to the WTO, let's not go and defend the current WTO. It, it was a disaster for us. It has denied India, for example, the ability to ensure food security to its citizens and livelihood security to its farmers. It has perpetuated a system of intellectual property rights which is obscene in the concentration of knowledge and in the unwillingness of large multinationals based largely in the north to part with any knowledge that would actually improve the conditions of most of the world and has enabled them to skim off huge amounts of rents and then to spend all their energies in parleying for more rents through lobbying and so on. So the intellectual property regime is one of the first things that needs to go. It really has to be attacked big time. The second big thing that has to be brought back on the table is financial regulation, both cross-border regulation and national regulation. It's not rocket science. It's been done before several times in the last century. It can be done quite easily. Again, only a few rules here and there. We don't have to keep saying, oh, well, you know, if we do it, capital will fly, because capital cannot fly if everyone is doing it together. We have to have, therefore, We have to recognize that the more concessions we have given to capital, and this is not just you, it's also us, they have not responded with more investment, more productivity, raising technological change, and so on. In India, the rate of investment has fallen for the last six years. I know with this great success story, right, and you know, doing really well, and so on. No. We have some of the worst economic conditions in the world, some of the worst inequality, but also some of the worst stagnation and jobless growth. And a large part of that is because no matter how many concessions you give capital, they always want more. It's never good enough, especially when the demand conditions are so poor. And so we are unable to actually force capital, to discipline capital, to do what it's supposed to be doing, which is productive investment. I think someone wrote a book about saving capital from, capitalism from capital, yeah, from itself, essentially. This is not really about saving capitalism anymore, because unfortunately, when capitalism goes, it's going to take all of us with it. It's going to take the globe with it. It has destroyed the environment to a point where it's going to take the planet with it as well. So whether we like it or not, we have to discipline capital, and we have to do it at a global level. And we have to therefore create international alliances that will insist on this. As I said, the chinks in that armor are already appearing. We have to build on those chinks and we have to build on the global solidarity that I think does exist, despite all the attempts of multinational capital to divide us, to create societies filled with hate and prejudice and anger and resentment, uh, despite all the attempts of multinational capital to control every aspect of our lives so that we're constantly monitored and locked up if we disagree and so on. I think there is enough, there are enough people out there who really don't want this, who really do want a society with a minimum of justice, with a minimum of equity, of, e of equality, of, of, of being able to appreciate the joys that come from relational activities. And I think, therefore, what we need to do is to present a positive agenda that certainly thinks globally, but as 
you mentioned has to be local, has to be national in its, uh, in its uh, orientation. But we also have to have a holistic idea of what is going on and a holistic agenda, but then be very specific and have specific goals on which we can build alliances. If I can name just one, the UK, as you know, uh, is, uh, well, I suppose, of course, you know, uh, is about to embark on its own free trade agreements <laughs> for various reasons. Uh, when it was part of the European Union, it was negotiating a free trade agreement with India. And it was the main mover in trying to enforce a system of intellectual property rights, which are TRIPS plus, which are really much, much worse. And of course, that would have destroyed the domestic drug industry in India, which is already under deep threat. But it would have made all of you pay maybe five times the drug prices that you're paying already today, which are already too high. Yeah? Um, that's the kind of thing we can actually take up specifically, but within the holistic framework, build alliances and demand that that kind of thing never happens. There are many, many more such things we could go on at length at all of this, but I think these are things that are possible if we have the energy and if we have the hope and the optimism, and I'm so happy that there are all these young people in the room who can take this forward. Thank you very much. She's the youngest representative in the South African Assembly. She grew up in a politically active home with her mother, active in workers' rights, and her grandmother active in women's rights. She joined the EFF as a member in 2015, served as media communications officer before being sworn in as a member of parliament in June 2019. Maridi. Oh my word, show people's problems. Um, hello everyone. Can you guys greet me like you mean it? Hello everyone. Ah. <laughs> um, my name is Naledi Nogukanya uh, Chirwa. I'm from Azania, uh, which is... Amanda. Yes, Amandala. <laughs> As I know, me Campbell says, um, Amanda, it's really, but yeah, it's Amanda, by the way. Um, anyway, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm really, really honored to be part of the panel um, and, and to be here generally. It's a really nice city, here and there, obviously. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think a very pivotal way of looking at global politics is also being cognizant of different marginalized identities and not forgetting to look at the world through the spectacle or the eyes of the marginalized. Now, what do I mean? Now, in South Africa, you know, our politics, socially, economically, um, are structured in a racial lens, in a gendered lens, uh, and that is how it trickles down, even with sexual orientation as well. So when you look at the positionality of a black girl in a rural area who doesn't have access to contraceptives, who can't negotiate condom use because transactional sex and different power dynamics affect how you present yourself as a young black woman. When we look at what socialism means for that person, the conversation changes. It changes immensely. It doesn't even take cognizance of different structures above. And it doesn't mean that this constituency is ignorant or naive. 
because their needs are also just as important. And, and that is the perspective that we offer as the EFF as well. Um, there's many things that we want as the EFF. There's 170 documents just for the 2019 uh, national elections on what we want to do as a political party. But first and foremost, we want our land back. We want our land back. It's an important conversation because 25 years into supposed democracy, political democracy, black people still own 13% of South Africa's land. And there's not even statistics on the amount of land owned by black women. And we assume it's, be, it's below a percentage because there's different social constructions that inform ownership of land by women in many parts of the world, in many parts of Africa. For instance, uh, if you marry and you change your surname, then the title deed does not have your surname as a woman. So transferring land then becomes a very hard thing to do when you get divorced, firstly, or when the husband passes. And then secondly, uh, you know, there's this, there's this understanding that the boys must inherit. You know, the inheritances go to the boys, right? And this is even on how social power is created, political power is presented. Uh, the echelons of power are controlled by men who are mostly white. And even if this is not overt, like at face value, now you see a black president, you're like, how oh, Nelson, is that you? You know, and you're like, how oh, that's my black president. Now? But what, again, what does it mean for a girl in rural area? who doesn't have access to contraceptives, who can't even negotiate condom use. What does positionality and representation mean for those kinds of people, for living as a queer body in a township area? What does it mean? What is economics from your perspective? And the most generic answer to all of these questions that we have is land. I mean, we cannot, we cannot erase the brutality and the viciousness of colonialism, which happens a lot. Uh, when we come into these conversations, you know, people expect us to uh, move on and forgive and forget. And oh my God, but you have a black political party in power, right? But the trenches of colonialism did not impose themselves on just segregation or people not liking each other. It was a brutality that still trickles down, that still has a manifestation even today with how we see ourselves as black people in different spaces. Um, I don't know if you guys saw me walking in and out here, getting off from stage and going to the bathroom, because I'm nervous, right? <laughs> you guys don't suffer from nerves. You do, but maybe they don't take you to the bathroom like five times. I even have to chill there and be like, okay, just chill, all right? And then you'll go on stage and it's the time to speak. Ne? And that is what, that's the depth of low self-esteem and trauma. I didn't particularly experience apartheid, but the ramifications and the effects of apartheid find uh, their voice on my life together with other young people in South Africa, young black people. And imposter syndrome is another thing that is very, very violent in how you present yourself and how you exist in different spaces. You don't feel entitled even to security. You don't feel entitled even to safety. And you feel you're asking for too much when you're asking for your land back. <laughs> now, even if, as the economic freedom fighters, we are very overt in, 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 in saying that young people must lead. I personally don't think, and I mean, you can get offended, but it's the truth. I don't think old people can give us solutions. <laughs> I mean, if, if they had the solutions, we wouldn't be having these problems, right? <laughs> yeah, I, do, I don't think old people can give us solutions as young people, especially if they've tasted a certain amount of privilege um, and social status that is no longer afforded to marginalized people. Uh, and which is why even as the EFF, we think or we believe and we exist as a party that doesn't speak 
for the marginalized, but has the marginalized speak for themselves? So what do you mean? If, you are talk, if you're going to talk about the workers and the miners uh, in South Africa, then you must have a woman who lost her husband to the brutality of the police in parliament. That is how you restructure power. You, you cannot speak on behalf of those people. If you're going to talk about uh, the rights of the LGBTQI, uh, you know, different kind of things and their personality, in, in, like economic personality, then you must have a young queer black woman in parliament. You know, so if you're going to talk about the intricacies of breaking down land policies and how it positions women and black women in particular, then you must have a young black woman to talk on those things and devise solutions for those things. Uh, and failure to do that, you are doing no different from what uh, colonialism and coloniality have imposed on black lives, to think on people's behalf and to propose solutions for the problems you created. It's really absurd, right? Because I mean, this is simple. I mean, this whole thing could really end like really soon if we just shared the land. And we're not even overtly radical. You know, we are not calling for the killing of uh, people who were birthed by settlers or anything like that. We are saying economic justice must not erase social justice and must be inclusive of social justice. Uh, we also speak of economic special zones as well in our manifesto where we say that part of urbanization and gentrification is, happens because there is no economic activities in the township areas and in rural areas. So we want industrial or inward uh, industrialization, right? Because our, our small industries or infant industries are not protected in South Africa. I'll give an example with the poultry industry. Uh, we are being exploited by the USA, giving us cancerous chicken you know, that we can't even reject because they threaten sanctions over our lives, right? Not that we don't have chickens in Africa, we have chickens. <laughs> we have a lot of chickens in Africa, right? But we have to import chicken. We don't even, you see this cup, this is a very simple thing to make, right? But we have to import it. The toothbrush, the one you use in the morning to brush your teeth, we have to import that. A washing cloth, a chair, a table, everything. So it doesn't mean that industrialization cannot happen. It means the state is not in a position to impose a economic freedom or, a, or, or liberation, if I may say, for, for domestic, uh, English is really sprinting on me right now. <laughs> but you get what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. You understand, ne? Yeah. So we are saying as the EFF, there must be special economic zones in rural areas to invigorate the economy, even from that level. And we are also calling for a, a borderless Africa. This is also another problem that colonialism created for us. You know, when people were deciding which part of Africa they like the most, they decided to create borders for us. Uh, and those borders have an economic violation, if I may say, on, on, on black people in Africa, because we can't trade freely amongst ourselves. We are still following the rules of someone saying, no, I actually like Nigeria. Let's, let's keep Nigeria for myself and my family. Right? And we are still functioning on those standards. Né? And part of the reason why we even spoke, speak in this informal way is to make sure that even the, 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 the discourse that's spreading amongst us does, is not lost from grassroots level. It's not, it's not classist and elitist. It's a very important aspect of engaging and mobilizing society to be part of the conversation. Because even when the expropriation of land uh, bill was being pushed in parliament and it was time for public participation. Ne? 
we had already organized society in a language they understand, in a discourse they understand that is not too elit elitist and not too classist. And they were thus being able to project what they see the world, what should happen in Africa or in South Africa, particularly with, the, with the expropriation of land comp without compensation, which is why it actually passed. And it's a process that's still being, that's still being pushed through in, in parliament with just drafting how the constitution is going to change and all of that. I'm just letting that out of the way. You're probably asking yourself, why is she so casual? That is, that is, I'm young. That is why. <laughs> so we want a borderless Africa because it makes trade much more simpler. Um, I mean, there's the opportunities of creating employment through tourism and, and free trade in Africa uh, provide for one in every hundred jobs created. And that is what we are being robbed of today. One in every hundred jobs that are being created is taken away because there's borders in Africa. Literally, that is it. And the GDP can shoot up by up to 14% if there is a borderless Africa. So there are economic opportunities. It is just that the West imposes itself because of wanting to regulate uh, Africa. Africa is the richest continent in the world. There's no argument about that. But our means of production, our resources, do not belong to us. Some of your friends here in London own our minds. Must talk to them. <laughs> Must talk to them before you want to talk to us. Must tell them, give them their minds back. Right? If we are talking about international solidarity, it also means holding people accountable, even in your own countries. <laughs> we can run our own minds. And we want to pay for our education with our minds. You know? It can't be that there's five people in Western countries that own minds in Africa. And there is no outrage. We don't even own a tiny piece of land in London. There is nobody from South Africa who owns land in London. Then why do Europeans have to own land in Africa? If we are really, really ready to talk about justice as well, before we confront different kinds of things, you know, and I, I was hoping to not be long. I have a tendency of, of speaking for too long if I'm not stopped. <laughs> and, you know, there's different ways of going about to activate society, which is, which is why the emergence of activists, even in uh, political spaces, has been such an important conversation in South Africa in particular. Um, so I was part of the, the group of young people who led the Fees Must Fall movement. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. Um, in 2015, we took to the streets, shut down our universities, and asked for free education. Um, it's a protest that happened consistently for almost three years. Uh, so it would happen, and then obviously police brutality comes, people get expelled, we get arrested, we get suspended. Uh, you know how the state responds to resistance, right? Kill them, just kill them, and get rid of them. And now we have the very same people who are leading those things in parliament and overlooking oversight and legislating. And it's very important, um, which is what I was saying, that you, know, you must not speak on behalf of people. You must give them a platform to speak for themselves. Uh, and we've got numerous grassroots movements which activate how we go about uh, you know, conducting a discourse in South Africa. Um, a very prevalent mode of violence is patriarchy. And you mentioned it as well. And we, we overlook how it frames how we function in the world, right? Um, our households in Africa are run, are ran by women, 60%. And in households where the men are, you know, active, they only spend 10% of their salaries. <laughs> in their families, on their homes, you know? And even at that, there is a wage gap inequality that is gendered, right? 
So women in South Africa still continue to earn 27% uh, less than their male counterparts, not because they are less qualified or less, you know, better or whatever, but just because they were born with a vagina or prefer to perform, uh, or not even prefer, perform a woman gender, né? then they earn less because of that. Uh, so even, even these kinds of lenses must not escape us when we talk about economics and what it means. Because now, even if how we got to the point of saying nursing and teaching is of lesser value uh, and engineering maybe of higher value was not necessarily because that is the case, but because women dominated these industries and so were deemed to be less. To be a teacher is a great and magnitude uh, position in society. You are literally framing the minds that will exist in a society. And we take that for granted because it, a woman, it is a woman-dominated industry. To be a nurse is to have the health of the country in the, in, the hands, in, your palm, in the palm of your hands. And that is neglected not because it is not an important uh, uh, industry or profession, but because it is dominated by women. So there's those things as well, right? Uh, but essentially, because I'm going to now say a lot of things. And I have to finish. Essentially, our, our, our solutions and how we want South Africa to look like is to be void, and this is going to take a lot, to be void of imperialism and capitalism, because that are, that those are our primary uh, problems in our country, and they frame each and every problem that trickles down from that problem. Uh, how capitalism finds its resonance or prominence in South Africa, it racializes itself, it genders itself. So we might not even have a gender problem if we didn't have a capitalism problem. We might not even have a patriarchy problem or a racial problem if we didn't have a capitalism problem. So essentially our enemy is capitalism. We've been very overt on that and there's no shame about that. And above everything else, we want, we want our land back and we want our land to be owned by black women, we want our land to be owned by young people. The EFF proposes that 50% of the land must be owned by black women and the youth. And that is a very, it's a progressive number. Uh, it's a progressive way of doing things. It is justice personified. And we are not waiting for us to get into power to push these things. We propose them in parliaments, even being an opposition party, the third biggest opposition party in the country. We still push for these things to happen because for us, it's not a matter of assuming political opposition, uh, positional power, but to see these things happening, right? Like now we've got expropriation of land without compensation about to happen in South Africa, a motion that was proposed by the EFF, and we are not the, we are not the government. Right? So that also proves to us that even opposition has some kind of influence in shaping politics. And what does that mean even for other countries in Africa as well? Opposition parties are pushing uh, the message of the gospel of, of, of socialism also find a way to impose their voice in, in, in different uh, levels of power, right? Uh, so we want our land back. Guys, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, that's what I'm saying in Zulu, there's a lot of you here. Speak to your friends. Tell them to give us our minds back. Tell them to give us our land back because you're going to take it by any means necessary. Thank you.